go into deep again. Um, so this is a maybe surprising start. Oh, I have to speak from here, otherwise I'll put on the microphone. So um, this is an artist uh, um, depiction of the reaction center of photosystem two. Now photosystem two is a part of green plants that does photosynthesis. And in this case turns water into oxygen because of sunlight. Okay, now why is this relevant? Um, the, the molecules that do the trick are the chlorophyll molecules. But if you take chlorophyll molecules itself, they don't do the trick at all. The reason why this works is because the, uh, of the whole configuration of chlorophyll molecules to each other and in an embedding of various proteins. And it's the structure and the bonding and also the dynamics and the physics and the chemistry and all together that actually makes these things work. Now, before you actually walk out uh, and think you're in the wrong talk, this is still the right talk. Um, this was my PhD research in 1998. Okay, so 25 years later, here I'm giving a talk in cybersecurity, and this is still relevant though, what I've done there, why? Important lessons I learned at my PhD is that nature solves a lot of problems on a system level. Whereas we physicists are used to be reductionists, we reduce, reduce, reduce to a system that we finally understand. But then, and then try to solve the problems over there. But nature of the source problem on a, on a higher level. Keep that in mind. This will come back for this talk. But why don't we solve problems often on a system level? And that's because we are not really trained in system level thinking, particularly uh, people in telecommunications, computer networking. We think in OC layers and try to solve everything on the OC layer that we know. Okay, instead of thinking out of the box. So and why can't we? As it's actually hard to understand systems. The whole theory about um, system thinking is still very much in development. Um, but let's uh, how how did how did they get from from 1998 to 2023 here? Um, that is in uh, uh, me in 1995. Uh, was also, uh, I don't know if um, you maybe still remember the Commodore 64, which was a revolution in home computing. And this was already luxury because I connected it to the, to the home TV uh, and had a cassette tape with my software on it. Okay. And my friends were just all playing computer games. That hasn't changed over 25 five years. But in that time, I was actually programming that thing to help me with my maths uh, homework. So that sounds recognizable today, doesn't it? And I also um, programmed the thing in assembly to actually be able to play mastermind again, against me properly. So that's that's what I did. So jump further after 1998, I combined both passions and went into telecommunication, um, joined KPN, the Dutch telecom operator. Uh, and why? Because in that time, telecommunications network, which was already a big system, was largely a single service monolithic hardware defined system. But in that time, that was when the internet came up and telecommunication networks were changing big, big times. Software was coming in, they become multi-level decoupled couples, so it became much more um, complicated. And that revolution is actually still going on. It started with the introducing of IP, the internet protocol, and now actually the whole network is being changed into large, one large computer network, if you like. So that revolution is still going on. And I'm, it was really, it is still really exciting. I'm proud of having been you know, part of that. Um, and that, hence, I went into cybersecurity because I quickly started to realize that that's an important part of that uh, of that transition. Uh, people in telecommunications were not not were not known at all. Were not used at all in terms thinking in terms of IT and computer and the cybersecurity issues that come with it. And now they're in the middle of it. So, um, 1998 joined uh, UNSW. Um, started with nothing, started building up this group, uh, which we call security of wireless systems. And um, here are my sort of the current members. Um, uh, Faisal Buos is a uh, um, senior lecturer in the group, um, uh, various postdocs. So you'll see these names coming back later in this presentation as the thank yous and the, and the um, you know, when papers come past, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, also a whole bunch of people I collaborated with on this topic. Um, and this is just about this topic. Um, so, and I'm just a cheerleader of them all, really, to be honest. Um, okay, so in, into the real talk, um, I finished, uh, you know, security of wireless systems research units of Canberra. So um, I'm going to say something about what is physical layer security. Um, once it, then I'll introduce you to software-defined wireless networks. 
then I'll combine the two. I'll show you how, how that is actually solving the PLS problem. Um, and then we dive into um, sort of the current and the future work we're doing. I, I chose three topics we are doing. Depending on how time is going, I can spend more or less on one or the other. Okay. So physical layer security. So what's wireless physical layer security? So this is known terms for cybersecurity people. So we have an Alice who wants to send a message to Bob, okay? And they want to send it over a wireless link. Now that wireless link is inherently noisy, okay? And physical layer security makes use of the fact that an eavesdropper is very unlikely to be at exactly the same location as the benign recipient, Bob. It's probably in another location somewhere, which means that per definition, the wireless channel is has a different noise characteristics than the channel of the, um, the uh, uh, between Alice and Bob. Okay. Now, if this if this channel uh, between Alice and Eve is noisier, whatever that is, you know, in terms of definitions of blah blah, is noisier or so worse than the channel between Alice and Bob, then you can actually prove with information theory that it in theory should be possible to send a message. You know, not fast, you know, with, with, some, with some throughput, you should be able to send the message from Alice to Bob over that channel in a way by, in which uh, Eve is not able uh, to decode, actually to decode the bits. Maybe Eve can decode some bits, but not enough to actually make sense of the message. Okay, now this um, is being introduced in 1975 by, uh, by um, Weiner. And um, a lot of a lot of information theory work has been going on uh, this model about you know what the conditions are and how you do that etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so and it's you know it was it was it was widely accepted as complementary to data encryption and that's actually the reason why interest in PLS is coming up again. For a long time, encryption was being seen as you know the problem to solve in wireless security. And now with things like um, quantum computers coming up, that's definitely not the case anymore. And we're looking at post-quantum uh, solutions and bringing back a physical layer security is, an, uh, is a possibility there. Um, one other term I need to introduce um, in about physical layer security is what's called secrecy capacity, because I will come back in my presentation. So, uh, secrecy capacity is the maximum capacity, the maximum capacity at which Bob um, I uh, can decode the message under the condition of perfect secrecy. So let's assume that you can, that you can modulate your channel in such a way that, uh, that Bob is still able to decode um, um, useful information from the data that you sent. Um, how, what's the maximum throughput capacity that you can do that and still guarantee secrecy from, from the eavesdropper? And it's interesting that the, the outcome of that is actually very, very easy. The secrecy capacity is actually the Shannon capacity of Bob minus the Shannon capacity of the eavesdropper. And the Shannon capacity B times, you know, B times the logarithm of one over um, um, signal divided by um, noise. Um, so, and for signal um, to interference plus noise ratio is larger than one, which is often the case. And you can actually approximate that with something very, very simple. Open 332 times the bandwidth of your channel times the difference in signal to uh, interference and noise ratios. So it sounds all easy. So what's the problem? The problem is it's really hard to implement in reality. Um, because I already said something, you really need somehow, okay, because if you don't do anything, eavesdropper still has a Shannon capacity and can still decode. So the secrecy capacity is good fun, but it, it only makes really sense if somehow you, you are able to modulate, to manipulate that channel in such a way that, is, that, that, that the eavesdropper cannot decode. And that's actually really hard to do. It turns out to be a pretty hard signal processing problem. And as far as we know, um, 2017, there was one guy in, from Virginia Tech who was able, was able to do that. Um, although when you really look at this um, at the thesis and this paper, in, in the end, it didn't really validate the setup, uh, the validation management or so-so. Um, and, and you don't need to read this. I just want to show that it's, this is only 
I don't know, 20% of what you build or so. It, it's a really complicated solution. And it only works in exactly the case where the East, where the, where the, the channel capacity of the eavesdropper is only is half of the channel capacity of the um, uh, of the benign station. So the moment that eavesdropper moves a bit, it's already gone. It doesn't work anymore. That, that's that's the status of practical implementation until a few years ago. And what's the problem? Um, the problem is is that everybody limits themselves to this model. That's what they try to solve. You have one sending station, one receiving station, one eavesdropper. Okay, but reality, in reality, networks are much bigger. And the network here at, uh, at Monash has many access points, senders, has many receivers, and maybe many, many eavesdroppers. So our idea, there's not a surprise though, is how can you can you tackle that implementation problem on a system level? And here is a spoiler. Yes. Okay. So uh, enter software-defined networking and software-defined uh, wireless networking. Okay. So um, probably you've heard about it. So uh, traditional um, computer networks have the data plane and the control plane integrated, which means that um, it's a completely distributed systems. Routers talk to each other uh, via using a protocol like BGP and uh, to decide when which packet has to go via, for, from A to B via which other routers and which path. It's a completely distributed system. That comes with a lot of um, advantages. It's very resilient. It's being you know, designed for defense, but it also comes with disadvantages particularly in networks that are not really changing. You don't need to have, where well, you don't need to have routers continuously talking to each other because it's pretty much set in stone which part it's going to take. So the idea of software-defined networking is that you take that control plane out of the data plane and have to, um, the routing tables in your router uh, being programmed directly by an external controller. The external controller telling the routers what to do given particular conditions instead of the routers trying to figure that out with the limited knowledge they each have with each other. A software-defined network controller has a global knowledge of the network, knows much more, and, and, um, and in that sense can make much more intelligent decisions about what, what the traffic should do in that network. So the whole idea of software-defined network is that you make the routing tables in the routers programmable by an external controller. Okay, when you do so, uh, it also means it opens up um, the uh, controller to what we call a northbound interface, where you then can start telling the controller what to do using lots of intelligent software, even machine learning, if you like. Okay, so this opens up, it basically makes a network, or at least a routing table, a routing part of the network, completely programmable with whatever you like to do. Now, this is now um, common. Um, uh, applied in uh, data center networks. They're pretty static, um, and, and this is what they do over there, okay? And it's now starting to become also a part of uh, 5G networks, and we expect it to be deployed in other parts of telecommunication too. So um, how, how does the SDN controller talk to the router? It uses a protocol, it's called open flow protocol. It's internationally standardized. It's a typically protocol with fields, and then you can add fields depending on how much you want to, uh, the, the, the open flow protocol to do. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, um, so at UNSW Canberra, we do lots of defense research, and this is just an example where you can fill, fill the defense between whatever you like. In reality, when you talk to telecom operators, they don't look at simple networks as on the right-hand side. They look at very messy networks, which have a lot of wireless involved too. Not just one technology, but lots of different technologies also. Okay? So networks are much more like this. Different technologies, different users, um, a bit coming and going. Um, not one controller, but different controllers, different parties being involved. Everybody wants to say there's also some clouds and satellites, whatever. So, the real networks are much more complicated, complex systems than, than the original idea of SDN. So from here to here is quite a way. And um, there's lots of wireless, lot, lots of security being needed. So security, security of SDN and software-defined wireless network is a big topic too. 
um, and you have multiple controllers involved. Now, enter European framework project. This is one of them that, uh, that I was involved with. It's called uh, Y5. Uh, we ended that in 2018. And um, so we looked at that um, in the first instance from a Wi-Fi perspective, because it's easy to handle also from a research perspective. And we looked at, can we, can we extend the concept of software-defined networking into the wireless? So that it, 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 being wireless is more than just replacing a cable with a wireless connection. Um, if you introduce wireless, you can also think about, you know, um, um, what to do on layer two in terms of switching, what do they do in layer two in terms of uh, MAC address programming, um, combining packets, um, uh, security of packets, you can, you can make that programmable too. So we started extending the concept of a software-defined network from layer three to other layers, uh, because they are important if you really want to use wireless in such a network. So here is the overall architecture. Um, a wireless device at the bottom, instead of switches or routers, we have wireless access points here. And we make them programmable, so you, you, you um, uh, flash them with, um, with our own software. Depends really on what the, what the chip manufacturer allows you to do, of course, what, what the SDK is that delivers with us. So in the first instance, we could only do that with Atheros Qualcomm chipsets, uh, but we have now been able to do that with a couple of other ones too. Um, and then uh, extend it as the end controller with Wi-Fi uh, parameters, and then have lots of things you can do with it, like horizontal handover, load balancing, radio configuration, packet grouping, and many more things, um, machine learning, if you like, on top of it. So that's what we implemented. First, on Wi-Fi. In our lab now in UNSW, we have extended the software-defined radio with a 5G network. So um, we're really, really working and developing this. Now, um, the only thing really relevant for this presentation is horizontal handover. What does that mean? Normally, um, an access point has a MAC address. It's called the BSSID. And when you um, walk with your device from one access point to the other access point, at some stage, it has to be handed over. And it's actually, it's actually quite a tedious process. You will lose connectivity for seconds or even 20, 30 seconds before you get it back again. And one of the reasons is because the device has to basically do all the connectivity again with the new uh, AP, which for them, it's a new identity, a new BSSID. If you make this programmable, you can actually make the BSSID programmable. So what you do, if a device moves from one from AP to the other one, uh, you actually have the BSSID moving with it. So you, 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 uh, so the, the identity of this AP, you then give to this AP. And when it moves, the, the device even didn't, does, didn't notice it moved. We checked that and it goes in milliseconds, hardly any disruption whatsoever. So it's not just the routing table, but also the basis idea that we have made programmable and you solve already a lot of problems. Okay, and that's what we're going to use later for physical layer security too. Um, just one, also from a timing perspective, one, um, I just keep, the, so the, the problem is, um, if you want to add all that functionality to the open flow protocol, you do have a problem because you have to go through standardization, which is a political um, um, organization with lots of interests and takes a long time. And not only that, the open flow protocol is not scalable to start adding all those functionalities that you want to add. It's never been designed for that. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time with it, but that's where um, P4 comes in. Um, I already said that we programmed an Atheros chipset but we're now programming a MediaTek chipset, and it's actually a different way of programming, which is not handy either. So luckily, um, um, chip manufacturers come together and start standardizing a program language, it's called P4, for programming the chipset. So that means that um, we, can, we can program the, you know, whatever protocol we like. If we're not bound to open flow anymore between the controller and the, um, uh, and the devices to program the devices, we can actually design whatever protocol we like or communication that we like given the system that we want to have by um by using p4 and then still being able to have different access points from different manufacturers and different chipsets in there because the, the the programming language is being standardized and then you use a vendor specific compiler to actually then uh, compile uh, the p4 code into um, um, um uh, into specific code for that uh, for that chipset so we're doing that. So that's one of the things in which we move to Wi-Fi setup. More um, 
uh, more different technologies as the uh, 5G for those who are moving from open flow to, um, to P4. Okay. So uh, for physical and security, um, so combining the two. So how, how does that go? So set practical link layer implementations of PLS very hard to realize, do not really exist yet. And it's easier to realize on a network level using the Wi-Fi type as the VM. So how does that work? I already told you that the trick of programming the BSS ID of an, so the identity of an access point from one to another, okay? From the perspective of the client, it's a little bit like moving your, your physical access points around, but not really, virtually, because you just use the fact that you have that an access point and you just move that, you know, that the, be the, the identity around, which for the client looks like if you're actually moving the real access point around. Okay, I'll come back to the uh, problem with physical layer security and I'll set the problem with the implementation before is that when, if, when the eavesdropper moves, you already lose the concept. But what now if you move your access point to a more intelligent place, depending on where Eves is going or where you expect Eves to be? So what we are doing here is we, the assumption, the initial assumption that the sender, the access point is being on a fixed location, that's something we move. We're going to move the access point. And a physical access point is, of course, not practical to move. But we don't move the physical access point. We do we move it virtually by using other access points in the network. And the more access points there are, the better. Because the more you can do that trick. That's the idea. So the idea is that using software-defined wireless networking, we, we can program a large wireless network in such a way that it always optimizes secrecy depending on uh, on your what you expect, where you expect that the eavesdroppers more or less are. Ideally, if you want to really reach secrecy capacity, you know you need to know the exact locations of the eavesdroppers. And that's often the assumption we make in the rest of this presentation. In reality, you can of course relax that requirement and say, okay, any throughput I get is, is, is okay. For if you know that I'm happy for just any throughput I get as long as I have perfect secrecy. Um, and then you can implement this without having an exact idea where the eavesdroppers are if you just assume like okay you know um sorry uh, they're just walking somewhere out of the building um you know that that could already be enough to get to get complete secrecy implemented yes 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 i'm fine with that so can't the eavesdropper just be passive like how would you no know? no the, the piece the eavesdropper is passive that's already the assumption eavesdropper is passive mm. so how how can the controller know where the eavesdropper is? No. So there are a couple. So one thing is, is that um, there are, so if an eavesdropper is completely passive and you don't have any pre-knowledge of what, where they can be, it's not really a realistic situation, let's face it, because, you know, take a situation like here. No eavesdroppers here, maybe eavesdroppers out there. You can make an assumption that you don't know exactly where the eavesdropper is, but you say, okay, it's somewhere outside this parameter. So you relax the knowledge of the exact location. If you know something, you can already use that to optimize your system. The other, the other point is, is, is um, um, in reality, even passive eavesdroppers release a radio signal that you can detect. So even, even then, uh, you already have an idea about, or you make an assumption that any any device that in the room of which you detect a beacon signal, which is not uh, in your access control list, you just assume that there are eavesdroppers. All goes, you know, all means that you, your secrecy capacity goes down. But again, that's something that's a trade off in, in real design. For us, more important is actually that we've proven that you can do it like this. Um, and this is the, the, the setup for that. So we're as simple as possible, two access points, X point one, X point two. Uh, in the demo I'm just showing is going to be X point two and three. Don't ask me why, it's so X point two and three. And um, we have a benign station connected to either one or the other. Uh, we have, this is the controller controlling uh, to which um, uh, access point that station is connected using the programmability of the BSS ID. And we have eavesdropper walking around, okay? And 
Um, I should put on this in the other order, but that's fine. So what you see here is the, um, the received sickle strength from the eavesdropper in black and in red, depending on which, which um, 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 uh, access point it's eavesdropping on. So when it's close to access point one, then the uh, received sickle strength for the eavesdropper is high. When it's close to access point two, then uh, this one is high. And what you want to, want to do is while this eavesdropper is walking around, when the eavesdropper is really good in, in eavesdropping in access point one, you want to have the benign station connected to access point two and the other way around. And every time here on the red, on the, on the arrows, that's actually when, we, when, we, when the system swaps, when it realizes that it's time to swap, okay? And this here is what we call decodability. So this is the, um, basically the amount of traffic that, uh, of the total traffic that's being sent that the eavesdrop has been able to decode. Okay, and bad news, so there's still a lot of stuff that can be called, but the good news is, and that's, you know, what's really about our zeros here. That's where we managed. That's where you have physical layer security in a $300 setup. You know, and then the reason why it's up here is all because it takes a long time for some delay, some of the measurements. I mean, it's all because it's proof of concept and not really, a, you know, this is not never ever how you should do it in industry. But for us academics, this was enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, for, they can't decode. Is there a way they can kind of figure it out? You know, like language. No, no, it's physical layer. It's zeros and ones. So no, way. no, below below the physical layer, there is nothing. There is just noise. Really? The lower you solve these problems, the, the better it is. If you can't get the zeros at once, what's left? No, it's what I try to say is that you know it's a system level thinking. Yeah. And, and plus, you know, combining, I mean, that's usually an innovation. It's combining two things, you know, from sort of different worlds. Because it worked because the development of software-defined wireless networking started to work out. And we, just, we basically combined them. This whole idea, the, the really novelty is, is, the, is the idea of moving that access point around, but just virtually not real. So this is somewhere on the web, I think. Um, so I'll do the voiceover. Um, so yeah, $300 That's what the whole thing costed. Cause you know, that time we didn't have any grants or money or yet. So everything had to go on the cheap, but there you go. Um, so this is the benign station. Okay, it's this one. This is the uh, the, the controller, um, and it's about. And we'll focus on that one. It's really about this part here, where you can see if the benign station is connected to one of the other access points. So this is um, access point three, and that's access point two, and this is the east hopper. So east hopper is now close to access point two. So the benign station is uh, connected to access point three, and that's what you can see there. Okay, so now we're going to move the eavesdropper. Uh, to a position closer, it wants, wants to drop in. So it's, it's going to closer to it. It knows that it's access point three that has the in interesting information. So I move the eavesdropper to access point three. And in the meanwhile, you see that the handover has happened to the X point two without any drop in traffic. The benign station hasn't noticed. Has it noticed it being handed over to the other access point because of security reasons?
No, we still have some time for, for, for so that's the basic message. But but now, of course, a whole swath opens of lots of stuff you can do. And I want to just you know get into a few things and you know the type of things we're working on at the moment. Some of them being published, just published on the review. You know how it goes. Okay. So three things. One is um, optimizing wireless network throughput under the so throughput of capacity under the condition of physical air security. So what's the problem there? In reality, a signal to noise ratio is actually hard to measure. What you've seen on the y-axis in my presentations, RSSI is received signal strength. How much, how much of a received signal strength is actually signal and how much of that is noise, you don't really know. So how to separate those, you don't really know. So it's nice, nice, nice idea sequencing, but in practice, and I do applied research, it doesn't really work if you want to apply this to a real setup. Okay, so um, the other thing is, is that what people generally would like to optimize is not so much the secrecy capacity, but the throughput, you know, the real, the real traffic that they can get under the condition of secrecy. Um, and that's, that is an issue because it's already a, a, a known issue that the network throughput somewhat relates to signal. I mean, you can imagine that this, if the signal to interfere with the noise ratio is high, you probably get a high throughput. Okay, so, so that's something we know. But actually the relation is actually quite dodgy. I'll show you in a moment. And it's because you have all these protocol layers in between. What the system does between having a signal to interference and noise ratio and actually make its throughput is depending on lots of things of what the protocols do in between. And modeling that is actually really quite hard, particularly, particularly if you, you know, if you know exactly what the, what the stack is, yes, but the, the more complex networks get, the more complex Wi-Fi gets, the more complex it really gets to model this. So from a practical perspective, so, okay, we said, okay, so um, can we actually, um, so the question is, can we optimize useful throughput under the condition of physical air security instead of secrecy capacity? And the solution is, you know, relax your requirements a bit. And, and here as we investigate empirically, if throughput in one way or the other can be used as a reasonable proxy for signal to noise ratio. We'll see how that works. So, um, for that, you need to go into simulation um, in, in simulation territory because again, SINR is hard to measure. Okay, so we're using uh, OpNet. Um, don't ask me why, but we're using OpNet gives really good results, and we simulated a real um, a, apartment block, if you like, with five apartments here on the floor, apartment one to three, four, five, and we have an, uh, the access points are in the red boxes here uh, along the corridor. And we have uh, benign stations in the apartment sitting on the sofa, for instance, doing something. And we have eavesdroppers here on the corridor. So let's say an eavesdropper here, uh, particularly look at apartment one, an eavesdropper here in the benign station here. And in, in the other apartments, people also just doing their thing. But the eavesdropper is really interested in what, what apartment number one is, is trying to look at. Um, so we simulated that with an, um, an um, uh, let's see if this is important. I'll tell it later about. So it's OpNet. Um, so this kind of event simulator, um, some stage we have to move to NS3, but but not now. Also because we have really good indoor models developed over the decades. Um, and this is being used by the fans in earlier times. So um, it's because of legacy reasons. And uh, what we did is, um, so, okay. So, um, uh, so access point one is always on channel one, okay? And you have 12 channels in Wi-Fi at the moment is what we, what we use. And we, we simulated 16 different scenarios, which we sort of coded is with walls, so the real apartments. Um, TX20 means uh, everybody is using maximum power, that's what you typically have. And C1 means everybody is on channel one. Um, C2 means uh, everybody's on channel uh, everybody is on channel two except for apartment one. So everybody moves away from that channel one. Even though channel one and channel two are slightly overlapping, by the way, um, or to channel four, which is further away again, or everybody's using different channels altogether. Um, TX1 means that everybody uses low power, um, so one milliwatt of uh, transmit power instead of 100 milliwatts, and FS means free space. So we, um, in simulation, you can do the take away the walls and do as if it is a free space model, and we compare the results. Okay. So we measured or we simulated them for all these things. We got signal to noise ratios and we got throughputs connected to it, okay? 
for the benign station as well as for the eavesdropper. Um, we calculated from the SI and NAS, we calculated secrecy capacity in all the cases. And what we also did, and of course, that's where some interesting results are coming. We also calculated the difference between the, uh, the throughput of the benign station and the throughput of the um, eavesdropper. Okay. And this is if you just put the throughputs, so the column, column what is it, two and four against the SINRs, then you indeed see is what you expect. You see actually quite a weak correlation. That's what we expected. It's really hard to model. Um, and there is a coefficient, yeah, there is a you know, 6 8 Pearson correlation coefficient. It's not very high. So, you know, that's a problem. Um, you, can't, you can't really use throughput. It's what we expect, and that's what came out. Um, this shows it again. So um, the line is so for, for six different scenarios in free space. We plotted the throughputs that we measured um, in a in the order of in order of decreasing. So the highest throughput for the scenario here and the lowest throughput for the scenario there. And the bars are the signal to noise ratios: the blue for the benign station and orange for the eavesdropper. Okay. Um, so in free space, we don't have the protection of walls. So it's actually quite easy to eavesdrop. And then you see that because the signal to noise ratio for the eavesdrop is relatively high towards the benign station. Your secrecy capacity is actually quite, quite slow, low if you look at the differences. And then here in this, those cases, you even don't have a real secrecy, okay? But in those other four, secrets, uh, four cases, you can have it. Now, what do you see here is that, that the, the throughput doesn't really depend on the signal to noise ratio. And that's interesting. So um, signal noise is going down, throughput not. And then here it's going up, throughput is going down. So that's that's strange. So what's happening there? So here, these scenarios are all on channel one. These scenarios are all on channel two. So something happens when you switch from channel two to channel one. And that's one of those things that happen in the higher protocol layers, which is called channel avoidance, which means that the moment that, that the system sees that other systems are, are communicating on channel one, two, it starts to back off and, and be polite and let the other ones pass. But the other one does that with you too. So the overall throughput is going down, regardless of SINR. That's a typical effect of what a protocol does. So here you see you know, a reason why this correlation really doesn't work. The surprise though, I mean, I mean there's a whole, there's a, there's, a, there's a gap here. And this is actually what we published in a conference paper. And now we're working on a journal paper for it and fill, filled up the data here. The real surprise is that if you plot the difference in throughput versus the secrecy capacity, your correlation goes up significantly. It's all put nine something. And we, we validated that for different scenarios, different eavesdroppers, et cetera, et cetera. So we have much more data. And you always get in correlation, correlation coefficients about 0.9. That's a surprise. So our hypothesis is that you can actually use the difference in throughput as a proxy for secrecy capacity and, that, and, and use that to optimize your whole system. So how does that work? So this, in this plot, you see, um, uh, so this, you see for um, lots of different 10 or so eight different scenarios with walls, okay, so with walls. Here we have plotted the data, the results in order of secrecy capacity. So the, 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 the scenarios with high secrecy capacity is on the left, with low secrecy capacity is on the right. Um, and that's a green line. In blue and orange, um, you see the, um, the actual throughputs. Now, yes, that these are the yes, these are the throughputs that we measure. Okay, for the benign station and orange for the um, for the um, um, for the east over. and the difference is the difference is hopefully totally then of course the, the difference between blue and red. So what you see here, look at this scenario here. So that's with walls, everybody um, transmitting on maximum power, and everybody on different um, different channels. This is your real typical scenario today in an apartment block in your student house or something like that. You know, you, you, what you, you probably know how to, how to tune your, sometimes they do it automatically. They choose a channel in which they see that, you know, fewer of the other people are using to, and you use maximum power. This is what systems do today. And here's the thing. 
you see that the secrecy capacity is actually not that not that great. You see that the eavesdropper throughput is not that is still pretty pretty significant. And what we try to the only thing we you and I try to do now this can do is change the channel. But changing channel doesn't get you out of that scenario. It's not going to solve you. So not collaborating. And in game theory, that's called you know the Nash equilibrium is on uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So it's non-cooperative game theory. If you don't collaborate, you won't get out of this. This is your Nash equilibrium. How can you get to, to higher secrecy capacity for apartment number one? For apartment number well, we're still looking at secrecy capacity of apartment number one only, okay? It works if everybody else moves moves to, ch to channel two for the sake of apartment number one. And what, what you, if you use the, the difference in throughput instead of secrecy capacity, you don't get at the highest point, you, you'll, you'll move to this scenario. That's, you know, you could have done better if you really were able to, to measure as sign up, but you are not. The blue ones are what you can measure, but you move to something pretty close. It's really not bad. Of course, that then, that then warns the question, why would those other apartments do so? Why would they do so? There must be something in for them, isn't it? It's not just altruism or something like that. So that then raises the question, can you make this a market? Can you trade this? Can you measure this? Can apartment number one remunerate um, the other apartments for, you know, for being, being good citizens? And that's interesting because then that means that throughput and security become just tradable resources. Now, that's a whole line of research we've started up a couple of years ago, obviously. Okay, I'm not sure if we still have time to get into that, but that's, that's, a, that's a key thing. Yeah, now I'll uh, start moving moving yeah. to the end. So um, I, I summarized this bit. Secrecy optimization, the network. Oh, so that's the other thing, of course, is what 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 are what are those what are those people actually doing when they move to channel two? They are jamming the eavesdropper because channel two and channel one are overlapping. So they're avoiding the channel avoidance mechanism of, of Wi-Fi because you're not in the same channel, but because they're overlapping, they're actually generating noise for the eavesdropper. So they're jamming the eavesdropper. So that's the other line of research we started. We started the line of research of can you trade uh, security and, uh, uh, and support? Can you make that tradable? And in an Uber type of fashion, can we create a platform in which the, the trading can be automated? And the second line of research is, is this, this jamming, can we in, in one way model this, understand it, and really became that, make that network endemic. Jammers have been around, but the whole idea to use idle access point, an idle access point to jam an eavesdropper just using dummy traffic, that's a whole other matter. But you can't do that with programmable Wi-Fi networks. You, you can do that without having to add extra hardware, without um, uh, leaving the, any, any of the standards, you can just buy stuff off the shelf, sell or stuff off the shelf. If it's programmable, you can do all that sort of stuff. I'm going to click to the conclusions. So physical layer security is hard to implement on link level, but we, can, we could achieve this on a network level due to the recent progress in software-defined wireless networks and combining the two. So the difference in throughput uh, between user and eavesdroppers appears to be a reasonable good proxy for secrecy capacity. Uh, and consequently, you know, we can use it as a proxy to optimize the, the system. Off the shelf, Wi-Fi networks, if programmable, can be programmed such that APs can be effective jammers for eavesdroppers. They're simply sending dummy traffic. Um, and you know, the developments are really going well. It was P4, we see in a, in, an important uh, step in there in making such networks programmable. And so for the fight, wireless networks can make wireless network research tradable among users. And that includes physical air security. So if you want to have a secret connection, you pay me a bit and I'll jam your, your ease up with a bit and then we're both happy. That's my story. We can talk more about it at the moment, but yeah. Sure.
Yeah, any questions or from the Zoom or from the room? And many, many of those uh, sender receiver is jobless. And uh, how, how if we adopt the system inside Monash, it's yeah. possible to uh, still uh, manipulate the yeah. uh, yeah. system correctly. So, so, so centralized control, centralized control uh, planes. Okay, I'll ask this one. So centralized control planes is of course uh, it always comes with a scalability issue. So in the software defined networks, that's an that's an issue that's being researched. We actually being helped here by the fact that it's wireless, because in the end, the only thing you need to optimize are the, the access points, the eavesdroppers, and the uh, benign stations that are within a range of each other. And the range is actually not that big. So in, in total, you're talking about you know, 100 devices max, not 10,000. Okay. So it's not uh consider the whole thing you no, you don't need to example, but one, two, three, yes five. correct yeah there is no reason to to consider is here to consider eavesdroppers you know two miles away okay thank you yeah if anyone online has any questions um you um, can post it oh uh, yeah i mean yeah can um, well, it says I cannot start the video, but thanks, Frank, um, for the for the talk. I have probably one or two questions. Um, look, um, one of them is about the Y five thing that you mentioned. M maybe you mentioned the reason why you call it Y five, but no, I, no. but, no. Um, but the, reason, the reason why we called it Y five is to get the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, because so Y5, so the, the official name of the project is what to do with the wireless Wild West. So there are five W's. So we decided to call it Y5 and it got us the money, I think. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. And then uh, the other one is probably you, you, um, you passed over it a, a little bit um, uh, fast because it was to, towards the end of the, the talk, but uh, regarding the friendly jammers. Yeah. Um, so you, you referred as to access points being uh, friendly jammers, but um, but to be honest, once we are talking about friendly jammers, I, I always thought friendly jammers are usually like, for example, these mobile devices, whatever that is, like, for example, a drone or uh, something which goes closer to, to eavesdroppers and try to jam them, right? Correct. Um, but here you you were referring to access points being the um, the, the friendly jammers, right? Right. Well, if they are, then probably because there is a whole line of research in that area on how to model like the interaction between legitimate users and illegitimate, like not not legitimate users. And and how they interact, like that there are also stochastic, for example, modelings of how to do it, how not to do it, how to distribute these uh, users and uh, eavesdroppers. But with the access points being fixed in a location, I think that's that's a whole lot of different um, uh, sort of research, area, right? Correct. So 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 again, we are helped here by our assumption that there are lots of access points. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not ideal. I mean, we, we are aware of all the, the work being done on friendly jumpers and optimization. Um, but here's the thing, we implemented it mm -hmm. and, um, and use it for to reach physical air security and you know, just using a network as is. So no drones needed, no extra hardware needed, you save on all those costs. And of course, you, you know, you end up with something which is not ideal because you can't move those X points around, but because they're programmable, there's a lot of stuff you can do, and that's what we've done. Yeah, but but it also requires you to know which one is adversary, which one is not, right? Like amongst the mobile users. 
That's so it's it. like you have to know your channel between your fixed oh. access point to the to all the users, right? Um, yes, but you do it. You know it to all the benign users if you manage your network properly. Mm. The, the problem are the eavesdroppers. That's once you don't really know, and and you do need to know it exactly if you want to if you ever want to reach real secrecy capacity. But again, then if you release that requirement and you say, okay, any capacity you can get, you know, we optimize the capacity that you can get and any capacity you can get under the condition of physical air security I'm happy with, that means that you can also relax the requirements on your implementations and then it actually becomes implementable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And if, if there is enough time for one more question, can I? Yeah, yeah, Monica says yes. <laughs> okay, Monica is happy. Yeah, I can go for it. Um, uh, yeah. So look, um, overall, I think some part of your 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 talk, you were talking about all this trade off between throughput and secrecy capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, within this software defined um wireless network, right? It's uh, SDWM. Right. Right? So so. Thinking of it as as going back to probably your very first slides, um, do do you have an explanation of throughput versus secrecy capacity using the Weiner channel itself? Like there is one sender, there is one Bob and one Alice, and then there is the Eve. You know, this is the question: is why this taking the difference in throughput somehow works um, and is a good proxy for? secrecy capacity to be honest i don't have a good explanation for that yet no okay no sorry yeah that, that's all right yeah that's why we are at the moment yeah yeah okay but well, uh, I'm happy it works and and here's the thing you know um because I, I i'm not sure if i used the word machine learning yet or not i mean because that's where where machine learning is going to be interesting is the moment that you can't really model your system anymore but you want to have something practical and implementable then just you know start generating a lot of data and if you know that the correlation is pretty good between the differences and and secrecy capacity then just go for it for your implementation even if you don't understand the complete model all right all right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So th thanks everyone for attending. And um, yeah, we'll see you at the next uh, Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.